I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. You can't think your way to success. You have to do things. So imagine if you're just reading about how computer programs work compared to actually writing a program. It's like so much more of your brain. You just feel it even while you're doing it. So much more of your brain is activated when you're doing something as opposed to just reading about something. Now, reading is important. Maybe you get some theory. Maybe you get some hints. Mm -hmm. Maybe you get this rough roadmap. But you're not going to get to your destination unless you get in the car and drive. And I sort of feel like the most important rule is what you call directness. I sometimes Mm -hmm. call it doing. Like Once you start (laughs) learning, you're going to be very quickly, no matter what area it's in, you're going to be very quickly better than everyone who's observing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So you really it's really important to find good people to get feedback from. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a that's the sort of best type of feedback is corrective feedback where someone can not only spot your mistake but tell you how to fix it. But in many areas of life, we just don't have that kind of feedback and we can still learn from feedback that just sort of is like a thumbs up or a minus or right. a laugh or a heckle. Like you can still learn from that feedback. But it's very, you have to be very careful not to overreact to it. Like you said, you you know, maybe the joke's funny, maybe it's not. Maybe you don't know yet, right? And I think sometimes people, especially when they have an emotional reaction to feedback, you know, someone tells them, oh, I don't like your business idea. And they're crushed and they're like, well, I'm not going to go do it. But I mean, if you had interviewed 10 more people, maybe like four of them would have said, oh, that's cool. Some people say, meh, like you get a bunch of different reactions. And so sometimes the key to overcoming feedback is just to get enough of it so that the individual pieces of feedback, you don't completely change your approach just because you hear some little negative reaction right some that's really critical craze. Yeah. yeah just like we described before in ultra learning you kind of give this step-by-step approach to essentially learn any difficult skills and like what other things did you go on to to learn you know yeah. what, what ultra learning projects as you call them uh, <laughs> right did you take on Um, all right, Jay, you tell me, you tell me when. Oh, I'm going to take some notes. Oh, yeah, oh we'll, okay. we'll, start, we'll, we'll start that with this. Ultra learning. So excited to have Scott Young on the podcast. He is the author of the brand new book, Ultra Learning, Master Hard Skills, Outsmart the Competition, and Accelerate Your Career. Scott, welcome to the show. Oh, it's so great to be here. And, and um, just by way of introduction, Scott, and I spoke once before, I think it was 2014 or 2015, after Scott completed a four-year MIT degree in computer science in one year. And since then, he's gone on to 
learn many other things. And he wrote, wrote this book, Ultra Learning, about how to learn anything extremely quickly by and not going the traditional route we think of when we think about learning. You essentially skip the 10,000 hour rule or, or ignore it to some extent. Well, for me, I just love the process of figuring out how learning works so you could figure out, you know, how do you get the thing that you want to be good at? How do you get to there, you know, either a little bit more quickly or even just more successfully? Because how many of us, you know, you try to learn a new language and you fail, or you try to learn an instrument, or you try to learn some skill that matters for your career and you get stuck, you know? And, and I first heard about you. And then we talked afterwards when you essentially learned, or essentially you got that computer science degree from MIT, or you didn't get the degree, but you studied yeah. the entire curriculum. You took the test, you did the homework, you did the four-year curriculum in one year. How did that come about? Yeah. So this was right after I graduated from university and I had studied business and Useless. like a lot of people, <laughs> yeah, like a lot of people, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I thought what better to study than business? Am I right? And then you get into this school and you realize, oh, business school is mostly about how do you be a good little middle manager in a large company and not really how do you start your own? And so when I graduated, I was thinking, you know what, I'd like to know how to like make things, not just, you know, look at spreadsheets. And so I was interested in going back to school to study computer science, but I mean, who wants to go back to school to get another undergraduate degree? And so around that time, I found out that MIT puts actually a lot of their classes, like the lectures, final exams with solutions, assignments, programming projects, they just put them up online for free. And so this kind of idea started bubbling up of like, has anyone ever tried to, you know, do something Sim similar or comparable to an MIT degree, but just using their free resources. And so this was this MIT challenge project that I did, uh, yeah, now actually about eight years ago in 2011. And so you got all this knowledge in computer science. Yeah. Did you ever take a job as a programmer? Well, I didn't take a job as a programmer because kind of ironically, that was this was right around the time that my own business as a writer and blogger was starting to pick up. So I did use the programming knowledge and computer science knowledge. Well, I mean, if you're doing anything online, it's involving tech, involving yeah. this kind of thing. So I'm making decisions all the time about, you know, we should use this software and plug in and do this kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, it was just one of those things that I never actually went into the programming career. Although right after the challenge was finished, um, you know, there was a people wanted me to join their startup. There was a guy from Microsoft who wanted me to set me up for an interview and these kind of things. So I think I probably could have gone down that direction. It's just yeah, life took me a different path. I think the debate you sort of triggered, which yeah. even to this day, is that, well, he didn't get the degree because it was just the online. Mm -hmm. They don't. They only give you the degree if they pay, yeah. if you pay them $200,000. <laughs> yeah. He just did the online thing. Would you actually hire him? And I always say to people, I am more likely to hire him because he took this initiative and did this in a year. It's, he did this creative thing that made him stand out. Yeah, the thing I loved about that is sort of after I finished the project, there was a Reddit thread that kind of blew up about it. And you see a lot of students typing in the Reddit thread, well, you know, it's too bad that no one would take this seriously because you have to have the degree. And then like right below, there's some comment like, well, I'm a hiring manager and I care if you're good at things. I don't really care about the degree. And I think sometimes the disconnect is that when students see the application process, they see submitting your resume and it's like, if you don't have a CS degree, don't apply. And they don't realize that that rule is just a filtering mechanism that, you know, if you get to know someone who works from this company, you often don't need a CS degree to work there. I was talking to a guy at Microsoft and he says, oh yeah, one of my best programmer colleagues, he got his degree in music. So what really matters, I think, in life is being good at things and being able to deliver value both to your employers, to your customers, to everyone. And that involves building real skills. And so sometimes credentials are necessary. I mean, you, if you want to be a doctor, you need to go to medical school. By law, but yeah. not by, but, but skill acquisition can happen without a medical degree. People don't believe that because it's so, yeah. we're so indoctrinated because of the law. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, like you'll go to jail if you give medical advice without being a doctor. But mm -hmm. I, I know plenty of people smart in medicine yeah. who, they can't, obviously they can't give medical advice because they're not <laughs> doctors, but you don't really need to be an MD if you take it serious. You could learn anything without the degree. And and the thing too that I try to argue in this book is that, you know, for so many people who even have the MD, they have the engineering degree, they have the law degree, they go into their career and it's like, this is just the starting point. Like that's not, doesn't mean you're a master at this. It just means that, okay, you've got an entry-level job now. 
And now you have to be really good at things. And so I think, you know, that's even true of what we're talking about. You get the computer science degree and you go start to work there. And there's a difference between being an entry level programmer and a senior developer, or there's a difference between, you know, taking an entrepreneurship class and starting a company. And so even if you do have credentials, you still need to learn skills. And so I think this underlies everything, you know? Well, it's, it's interesting. So after the computer science degree, and I want, I want to get back to that in sure. a second, but, and we're going to talk about how to learn you know, you, you you basically, in your book, Ultra Learning, you discuss what I call the, the grammar of learning, how mm-hmm. there's these common components to any difficult skill you want to learn and how, how anybody can use these components to learn essentially anything. And you've done it with, with language and you talk about people who've done it with other skills and you've mm-hmm. done it with other skills. You, you Rather than getting fascinated with programming, you got fascinated with learning and, yeah. and went in that direction. But the the thing that's interesting about learning computer programming is that then sometimes people who don't know computer science, they say, well, what programming languages do you know? And the interesting thing is if you know, if you learn computer science and computer programming, how you did the way you learn another language is you kind of set up the environment for that language on your computer and you Mm -hmm. find a real program written in that language. And then you just start modifying it and you'll learn it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, even doing this MIT challenge, I think there was probably I think they did it in four like classes, various classes did like four or five different languages. So you even got, I even got some exposure doing it there. But I think there's so many of the same concepts that programming languages are most of the modern ones that people use are, are more superficially different rather than like, you know, wildly different things that would require a completely new set of study. If you're good at one language, you can be good at 10. It's not. But it not reminds crazy. me of, you have an example in the book where a guy is on the fly, like in real time, learning yeah. a language. Like he's asking yeah. an expert at the language questions and then he figures out what kind of language it is, how the grammar is structured. So he's learning, he's using what he's learned from maybe 50 other languages to, to on the fly, like in a half hour, learn another language. Oh yeah, language. this is Dan Everett. This is just amazing. I just watched this YouTube video where he like goes on stage and you can always think about, you know, your times where you're struggling through like high school Spanish classes or, you know, oh yeah, how did you conjugate French verbs or things like this? And this guy's standing on the stage and the person comes on stage and she speaks uh, sort of an obscure like Southeast Asian dialect which um, he had never he had never heard before and he doesn't know and he can't speak to her in any language that they share in common that's sort of the rule of the thing because this is a method used to like go into the jungle and like speak to you know amazon tribes and like learn some obscure language that is very difficult and in like half an hour he's like written out okay this is how you'd say this this is how you'd say that and you can hear him describing it and so the thing is is that he has such a rich sort of map of how languages work that if you give him a new situation with a new language, he can immediately like figure out a lot of things where, you know, might've taken you years in high school Spanish class. So that kind of what you said, understanding the grammar of learning, I think is so valuable because a lot of us get stuck because we don't have that grammar. We can't speak that language. Right. So he had this map of how to learn languages, yeah. just like we described before a map to learn different computer languages. Yeah. Um, but, but in ultra learning, you kind of give uh, this step-by-step approach to essentially learn any difficult skills. And like, what other things did you go on to, to learn? You know, yeah. what, what ultra learning projects, as you call them, uh, <laughs> right. did you take on? So after doing that MIT challenge project, I was, you know, very excited by this potential of like learning hard skills and, and doing it in this way. And so I did a project uh, with a friend and we called it the year without English. And so we went to four countries, uh, Spain, Brazil, China and South Korea to learn Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, and Korean. And the idea of the trip was just to try to do it through immersion. So in, when we would land in each country, we would stop, you know, we were not speaking in English to each other and we would not speak in English to people we'd meet and just try to speak the language we were learning. And when I describe this to people, it they have this sort of like, oh my God, that sounds crazy difficult. I could never do that. But the funny thing is, is that I've done it the other way where you go to a country and you just try your best to learn it and it's actually much easier. So that's sort of the counterintuitive nature of this is that sometimes doing the sort of harder thing that requires a bit more effort and a bit more planning and a bit more foresight can actually be easier because once you set up your environment, then everything reinforces this idea to do this immersive learning. Whereas if you go to a place and you make a bunch of friends who speak English and you always hang out with them, then every single time you want to practice, it requires effort. Whereas if you set it up right from the beginning, 
then, well, yeah, you're, you're speaking this language and maybe you're not always fully articulate, but you're spending, you know, eight, nine hours a day practicing and it's just your life. You don't really think of it as practicing. Right. So it, it's sort of like you're isolating two things there. One is, um, the environment, if you want to learn something, you have to kind of design an environment around yourself that forces you to learn it. So if you're going to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to go to a place where everybody's speaking this other language yeah. and I'm p imposing the restriction that I cannot speak English, that's creating an environment, just like what you would set up your computer mm -hmm. environment to, to yeah, learn yeah. a computer language. You're saying an environment to you're forcing yourself to either learn that language or be miserable for three months. Yeah. And did you, you, know did you what? end up learning the languages? Like, how oh, long yeah. Ago? Yeah. Like in Spain was our first country we went and that was the most like clear success because like after a month we were, you know, having friends, going to parties. <laughs> I was dating a girl in Spain. Like it was, it was very, felt very comfortable. Now I wouldn't say we were fluent after a month, but we were very comfortable. And that I think is almost more valuable than fluency because that's what people are afraid of. They're afraid of going there and just feeling awful the whole time. And so after a month, it just felt totally normal. I mean, you know, we were still not in the speech of like, I could be giving this conversation after a month, but I could definitely be doing everything that I wanted to do. And so after three months, it, it was just, it felt like, oh yeah, we could just keep living here. It'd be totally fine. Now, Asian languages are a bit harder. So China and Korea were more difficult than Spain. And I would say that roughly, if you are thinking about doing this, probably estimate they're probably about three times as difficult as a European language. So it does take a bit longer and it requires more preparation and hard work. But even then the method still worked. It just, it just took a little bit longer to really get in that rhythm. Well, uh, well, and the second thing you did was you set yourself, um, you kind of, uh, set yourself a hard problem. So yeah. as opposed to sit, taking a Spanish class here in the U S <laughs> where you could learn it over time perhaps, and it's not so difficult, but it'll be slower solving hard problems in the domain you're trying to learn me. And, and in this case, going to Spain and only speaking Spanish is going to be a difficult challenge and even awkward and even you can make you unhappy at times. <laughs> Setting yourself a difficult problem is often the best. Pe people don't do that. They're afraid to set themselves diff difficult problems. So I'll say this because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this who are thinking maybe they'd like to learn a language, but they're like, I can't go to Spain for three months. And I want to say this, that I don't think the key to the method is going to the other country. Now that helps. Certainly it gives you an excuse to speak in this language, but you don't even need native speakers to practice. You could just find some partner and just say, Hey, you know, for an hour a day, we're just going to have a no English period where we're just going to practice this language. And so the difference and the reason why this method works better than a lot of times where you spend in the class is because because you actually rack up time speaking and you actually rack up time practicing. And the practice is in the situations that you actually find yourself in, in conversation. So you learn words because you need to use them, not because they show up on a vocabulary list. And so a lot of people I think get in their heads that, oh, well, the key is that you have to travel there and then you'll learn very well. A lot of people travel and they don't learn the language. When we were in uh, Korea, I knew a guy who had been living there for 14 years, wanted to learn Korean. And I mean, he, he couldn't speak it at all. And so just going there isn't enough. I think that the key is structuring yourself again. If, if you know, if we wanted to have, all right, let's, let's set aside an hour a day. And, you know, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a work colleague, maybe it's a friend of yours, maybe even just someone that you communicate with on Skype, you could set aside that time and do it. So I don't want to give the impression that this is just some technique that's only reserved for these people who can take, you know, months off of their schedule and go deep down into it. It's for really for everyone once you understand how it works. And and, and you mentioned in the book also that, um, you know, you have to figure out why you want to learn something. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you want to learn a language so you can speak to friends who speak Spanish, mm -hmm. or you want to go to Spain eventually mm -hmm. and be comfortable speaking it, that's one thing. If the reason you want to learn Spanish is because you want to read Spanish books, books written in Sp Spanish, that's a completely different skill, really. Not totally different, but different enough that you can focus on learning to read rather than to speak, and mm -hmm. you'll do that much faster. If it, it, you might not speak, but you'll be able to read. And if you and, and yeah. if you're trying to learn to speak, you might not be able to to read or write, but you'll be able to speak it. You kind of have to identify what 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 the micro thing is that you're learning. Yeah, and it's not because, well, if you spend all this time learning to speak that you're going to be illiterate, like obviously they help each other. But I think the right way to think about any learning problem you have, whether it's language or career skill or anything, is to always start with, what do I want to do? 
Because if you just focus on what do I want to know in my head, then often you're missing a lot of the ingredients that make learning like this work. So one of the principles I discuss in this book is this idea of directness. And we know from basically over a hundred years of psychological research that people are really bad at something called transfer, which is the ability to learn something in one situation, say in a classroom, and apply it in a different situation, say in real life. And the reason for this is there's lots of different suggestions. Part of it is just that when we start learning things, transfer is harder. So as you develop expertise, it's easier to transfer. If you're fluent conversationally in Spanish, it's easier to transfer that to reading than if you've only learned a few sentences back and forth. But at the same time, it's also because when we are learning things, we tend to use this metaphor of the school where it's like, I'm just going to dump information in my head and store it in my head, and then it'll just be there when I need it. Whereas what you need to ask yourself is, what do I want to be able to do and make sure that I'm doing a little bit of practice that is related to that situation from the very beginning? So if your goal is to have these conversations, you know, practice a little conversation when you start out. But 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 I would argue, tran like yeah. so you mentioned, yes, transfer from school to real life setting, it could be difficult. Mm -hmm. And that I understand because there's a lot of debate about whether schools actually use good methods for teaching. Mm -hmm. They use good methods for teaching to take a test. They yeah. might not use good methods for teaching real life. Mm -hmm. But let's say you learn, you, you, you spend three months learning Spanish mm -hmm. and then you go to France, you're probably the meta learning, the techniques you use yeah. either intuitively or, or by method to learn Spanish. You could probably transfer those techniques to learning French. Oh, absolutely. And you know, when, when we were doing this trip, like when we first went to Spain, there's all this trepidation of like, oh my God, is this going to work? Like, are we crazy for planning this? And, you know, you're sort of like nervous. You're landing off the plane like, okay, I'm not speaking English for a year. But then when we get to, you know, Korea, well, I mean, it's a completely new language. We have to learn everything from scratch. We're still kind of objectively in the same position we were when we landed in Spain. But by now, the process is a routine. It's like, oh, okay, we got to do this. This is the method. This is how you do this and this. And so I think you're absolutely right that what I'm trying to do in this book is to try to show people this sort of overarching layer. And for a lot of us, we've sort of learned kind of how to do things in school, how to learn something so you can, you know, maybe pass a test. And I mean, some of us, we're better at that than others. But for a lot of us, we haven't had that experience of how do I acquire a skill that I really care about that's not in a classroom, that isn't having some you know teacher telling me exactly what to do. And so that's what I'm trying to hopefully give those people this nudge so that they can you know get some of these sort of meta-learning principles and go out there and do their own projects. You know, one, one thing I wasn't sure if you mentioned the importance mm -hmm. of, but how important is kind of, uh, let's call it obsession or love. Like how yeah. how much do you have to love what you're going to learn. Like if someone told me, James, learn Spanish right now, I don't think I would learn it because I don't really care, care. about learning yeah. it. <laughs> no, and I think you're absolutely right. And for me, that's one of the things that I think you can't break down. Like, okay, here's, here's how to be motivated to learn something you hate. Rather, what I would like to do is I think all of us have something that we'd like to be good at. There's that, I really wish I could play guitar. I really wish I could speak this language. I really wish that I could, you know, get a promotion and get out of this dead end job. But the problem is that often we've had sort of negative experiences in the past trying, maybe you tried to learn a programming language and that, that didn't work out or you, oh, well, I, I, you know, I had Duolingo for eight months, but I can't speak the language after. Maybe I'm just not good at this. And so I think there's two things you need to have that inspiration, that thing that excites you. And, and I think that's absolutely essential. If you're not excited to learn Spanish, then don't learn Spanish. But at the same time, you also have to learn like how much your own trepidation and fear comes from sort of maybe these past experiences where maybe you didn't even realize that you had a bad method that you were using and that you weren't on the right track to success. And, and it wasn't because, you know, you're not smart enough or not talented enough, but because you just weren't using the right approach. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you, you discuss the most important, uh, what I view as the most important rule, they're all, all you, you mm -hmm. your table of contents is basically <laughs> the set of rules and, and methods you use for yeah. this ultra learning. And I sort of feel like my, the most important rule is what you call directness. I, I sometimes mm -hmm. call it doing, yeah. you can't, <laughs> you can't think your way to success. You yeah. have to do things. So imagine if you're just reading about how computer programs work. Yeah compared to actually writing a program, it's like so much more of your brain. You just feel it even while you're doing it. So much more of your brain is activated when you're doing something as opposed to just reading about something. Now, reading is important. Maybe you get some theory. Maybe you get some hints. Mm -hmm. Maybe you get this rough roadmap, but you're not going to get to your destination unless you get in the car and drive. So, so I, I, 
you know, and like, and like, you know, for, for computers, you did all the homework, all the, you took all the yeah. finals, you, 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 you passed the tests for languages. You didn't just read a Spanish textbook. Uh, -huh. uh you went there and you did it, uh, you know, in the forward, uh, James Clear, uh, the forward of your book is mm -hmm. written by James Clear, who wrote the book Atomic Habits. He got fascinated by uh, photography. Mm -hmm. He took 100,000 photographs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love your examples on drawing, and you show examples of day one versus day 30. <laughs> you you didn't read about art and drawing. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you did a little because it helps to read, and, and you yeah. you mentioned in your first rule, meta-learning, you know, get, get the basics, do the mm -hmm. research, but you would basically draw over other pictures or your older pictures or, or see how close you were to, you know, what you were trying to, to, to draw. You would actually draw in order to learn to draw. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the methods that I use there, and I mean, it's a little hard in a podcast to show what the images look like, but, uh, but it's can, really yeah. impressive by the way, <laughs> day, day one, by the way, still look better than what I would draw, but essentially it was Whoa. like a, a circle with a beard. And uh, <laughs> by day 31, it looked like it was a semi photograph. You know, what's so funny about that though, is that the day one wasn't even like the first time I tried to do that. Cause I tried to do it and I'd struggled. And so it was sort of like, no, 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 I got to take this a little bit more seriously if I want to actually do it well. And so we were considering, cause like two or three months before I got to that day one photo, I drew one, which is actually like atrocious. Like it doesn't look good at all. And that was like me trying for like kind of on and off for a little bit to get to the day one. And then day one to day 30 was where I kind of really did this sort of ultra learning process. But one of the big things I did was you draw a picture and then you just take a, with your iPhone, you just take a picture of it. And then you just put it on your computer and you just get like a semi-transparent version of the photo you were trying to draw and just overlap it and just sort of see like, where don't they line up? And then you quickly learn, oh, you know, I made the head too wide. That was the problem. Or I put the eyes over here. Or I did this and that. And so, so that's build, one of those. You would build some heuristics. Yeah. But you st in order to incorporate the heuristics into your actual skill set, you still had to do Oh yeah, you had to, I did over like and hundreds, over again. hundreds of them, you know. So it, it, but I think for a lot of people, again, it's sort of one of those things that you look at someone who can draw a portrait and you're just sort of I have no idea how to do that. It must be magic, you know. They must just have a lot of talent. And you don't realize that not only is it a lot of practice, but it's also having the right technique. It's having the right method for doing it. So even for me, I found techniques that you use for drawing portraits even halfway through there. And it guides you through a step-by-step -step thing that like, honestly, if you follow that method for doing it, it's better than even tracing. And I mean, not everyone wants to do portrait drawing, but I think it's just a perfect example that if you're not aware this method exists, then for you, it's just, well, you must just be an artistic genius to be able to do that when it was really, no, 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 I'm just applying a, a method. Well, by the day 30, it looks like you're an artistic genius. So let's, let's actually, that's a great example. Let's like walk through that where, yeah. okay, you know, your, your first principle meta learning um, first, you, you, mm -hmm. your subtitle of that chapter is first draw a map. What did you meta learn about art as you underwent this project? Oh my gosh. I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine. That's M I Z Z E N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes, travel clothes. I'm trying, I, I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untucked shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. <laughs> Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmaine.com and save 20% 
when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports? is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. What did you meta learn about art as you underwent this project? So there were about two phases with there. So what I'll just start by saying like what, what I mean by meta learning. And what I mean is that most of us have never really done this process before because you've gone to a school and someone's just told you what to learn. There's been a curriculum and said, okay, unit one, you're going to learn this. Unit two, you're going to learn this. And the problem is that if you start doing your own self-education project, you're like, I'm going to learn this thing. It just starts to be a bit overwhelming. Well, where do I start? What resources do I use? What how should I learn it? What's the right approach? And so before you even start a project, you should do a little bit of research to figure out how do other people learn this skill? What resources out there? What are the difficulties that they face? What are the things that, okay, this is going to be the obstacle and I'm going to have to work some way around it. So what, what did you think was, what did you find as the obstacle? For well, instance? I think for drawing faces, one of the major obstacles is first of all, we have a very sophisticated pattern recognition system to recognize faces in our brain. But that also, because we recognize faces that way, we never really look at faces. So we we see your face, and I like I'm looking at you right now, and I see your face. And and if I were to like be showed a photo of you, you know, years later, I would recognize you instantly. But if this were covered up right now, and I would say, okay, draw his face, I don't think I'd be able to do it because when I'm looking at you, I'm not thinking about you know how you know how large is your nose, where are your eyes relative to this, (laughs) you know, what is this kind of thing. I'm not really thinking about those details. And so one of the mistakes that a lot of people make when they start drawing faces, for instance, is that they draw like children do this. Well, they'll draw the eyes at like the top two thirds of the head. Whereas if you actually look at someone's head, the eyes are about halfway in most people. Some people it's a little bit above, a little bit below, but halfway is about the median point. And so this is just an example of where you take the face, which is really only this sort of this part of my, my head, 
and you just expand it because it's the most has the most detailed information. So you don't really think about how much space my forehead takes up or the back of my head or, or this kind of thing. And so the first thing you have to do when you're learning to draw faces is just learn how to see things and actually see what is the relationship and like how you know how wide is it to how tall is it and this kind of thing. So 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 let me let me just yeah. summarize that there. It seems like it's almost like you can build yourself a set of uh, shortcuts mm -hmm. that most people don't know and that just applying those shortcuts, and this is just, I know yeah. this, you're just describing the first step in this, but just applying those shortcuts automatically probably puts you in the top 20%. So for instance, um, knowing that the eyes, you could, you could draw a circle mm -hmm. and put two eyes in the middle of that circle and you're probably already better than most other yeah. people trying to draw a face. And there's probably, I'm guessing there's probably like five to 10 other really easy heuristics like that, that, that gets you 90% of where you want to go. Yeah. So that was sort of the starting point for me was using that approach of like, okay, you know, just can I, can I actually just sort of see where is this with relation to this? And then uh, I was working on that for a while. And then like a lot of people, when you're working through the middle of a project, I started to stall. So this is only a month long project, mind you. And so about two weeks in, I'm doing this approach and I'm, you know, I'm getting better, but I'm hitting that plateau. And the plateau is something that we all hit in various skills that we're trying to learn where you're like, I keep working at it, but I don't seem to be getting better. And so at that point, I did another round of research where it's like, okay, now I've done it for a while. I kind of know what's involved. I kind of know how good I can get with this approach. What do I need to go further? And around this time, I found this course that's taught by this Chicago art studio called Vitruvian Studio. What's that, it called? Um, it's called Vitruvian Studio. They have a portrait drawing course. And if you want to see like, like this guy draw, like they're better than photographs than what this guy can do. And, mm -hmm. and the thing was, is that I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to invest in this course and, and sort of see what he's doing. And what he showed in that was like another method. And this method was like, how do you get like sub millimeter accuracy when you're drawing something? Because if I were just to draw your face right, it would be very difficult for me to put the eyes like, you know, on the page. There's nothing, no reference points with like that level of accuracy without, you know, just years and years of training. But this was a method of like, how do you, how do you check when you're sort of still sketching it out, whether it's right or what's wrong with it? So again, he's giving like some sort of set of Another set of shortcuts. methods, another set of shortcuts, another set of like heuristics that again, you have to practice and you have to do a lot, but it, it helps you with it. And I think, you know, again, for, for the people who think that, you know, portrait drawing is too inside baseball, I don't want to necessarily learn portrait drawing. I think the, the meta learning rule here, what we're looking at here is just learning to feel out when you're getting stuck and learning really like, okay, do I need more practice or is it like, okay, now do I need to go back and look for a method? So a lot of this sort of approach is just kind of feeling out, okay, when do I just need to, you know what, I've got the right approach. I just need to grind it out, get enough practice versus I'm stalling right now. And maybe there's some way that I can rethink about my process for getting the result I want and improve the product. So I think that kind of feeling those intuitions is something you develop over time. I, I think that's important because like I, chess is the basic example where I've seen people who play chess for like 30 years, mm -hmm. but, and they play in tournaments, whatever, they never get better. Now they're doing the doing mm -hmm. they're playing. And that again, will get them so far because, uh, you know, tournaments are mm -hmm. so stressful. Your mind is going to be completely focused. It's, it's, you know, you don't want to do badly. So you're going to try very hard to do well, as opposed to just a casual game. Um, but they still plateau. There's always that plateau. Mm -hmm. And at some point you have to take a step back and ask yourself what I'll call it a micro scale, what micro scale you're not learning and how can you learn it? Like what's another technique for, for, for learning. Absolutely. And then you need some feedback and you talk about feedback. You need mm -hmm. some feedback to understand what micro scale, like, did you have feedback to say, uh, you know, uh, you aren't doing this right in your drawings. Well, I mean, well, I was doing this sort of overlay method and, you know, you get better at some point and then you just sort of like, I'm not getting better. Like I'm kind of staying because the mistakes started to be random. So like I was telling you at the beginning, the mistake is that maybe you just consistently put the eyes too high. But at some point you're making mistakes, but they're all different from each other. So it's all just, I'm not accurate enough. Like I'm in the right ballpark, but like sometimes it's too wide, sometimes it's too narrow. Sometimes it's too high, sometimes it's too low. So it was recognizing I need a different way to get more accurate than this. And I mean, the portrait drawing is, is again, it's, a, it's an example, but I think when we're, we're thinking about all the skills that we're looking at, there is that sort of, you need feedback not only to correct your performance, but also feedback to feel out when do you need to sort of, okay, let's double back and like look and see, you know, should I be using a different resource or should I be using a different method? And so that kind of feeling out, like when we were talking about learning languages, um, you know, when I was in Spain, the immersion process, that was enough. 
When we went to China, it was suddenly someone speaking words to you and they'll tell you the word, but you can't remember it because they all sound the same to you and they're all so similar and you can't remember the tones and this kind of thing. And so I actually found flashcards were helpful there, but that's something that you kind of feel out as like, okay, there's this issue that I'm having. I'm, I'm hitting a plateau here. Let's go back and see if we can find any other methods. And so put a lot of these methods in the book, but I mean, getting that intuition is, is such an important part of the process. Right. Your, your feedback uh, principle is principle number six here. This, I mean, every chapter was really valuable, but, what was, mm-hmm. but this was incredibly valuable because there's always a question, what's constructive feedback yeah. as well as versus destructive feedback. And often, like, let's say if you're an artist, a writer, or even we're, we're doing this podcast in a comedy club, even yeah. if you're a stand-up comedian, Feedback can be very destructive because you don't know what the agendas are of the people mm-hmm. giving you feedback. But you you defined it in two words, and I love it. You basically said, correct me if I'm wrong. You said if it's a feedback should be informational and usable. Is that the, yeah, that yeah. The two I think words? this was uh, uh, Ruiz Primo and uh, the other I forget her name, the other researcher who wrote a, a little book on giving feedback. And one of the things that I found really interesting because. You know, I, I've been really interested in the process of learning. So I'm imagining I'm going to go back and do the research and it's going to be like thumbs up, like feedback is good 100% of the time. And in this meta-analysis where they took hundreds of different studies on the impact of feedback on learning, they found I think 38% of the cases had a negative effect. And so the interesting thing about this is that, you know, feedback is is quite valuable, but there's a lot of feedback that doesn't help. And so what people who are successful learners learn to do is they learn to know what they can gain, what kind of information they can gain from feedback, and also what, you know, this is just noise. I should just ignore this. So one of the things I talk about is a classic thing that happens to entrepreneurs is, you know, they don't have that many customers trying out their prototype. And then they say, well, what, what did you like about it? And then they give a bunch of feedback, but that's often spurious. Maybe they say, oh, well, I didn't like the color. But it's not that they didn't like the color. It's that they had this overall holistic kind of assessment of using it. And the assessment was meh. And now you're asking them to give a reason for it. And so they have to just sort of make one up. So they say, mm, well, I didn't like the color or I didn't like this. And so this can be true, especially like if you're a comedian, you can know whether or not they laugh at a joke, but you don't necessarily know what would make it funnier. So if you go up and ask them, hey, what would have made that joke funnier? Maybe they'll tell you something if you really ask them. But that answer isn't necessarily going to help you because they're not a comedian. They don't necessarily know why they didn't think well, that was well, funny. Well, right. So so informational and usable are, are mm-hmm. some good uh, definitions of what's good feedback. But also you kind of need feedback from someone better than you to, yeah. to give the information. Because I remember when I was first starting, sometimes I would tell a joke and it would work. And then the next day, I would tell the same joke in the exact same way and it would totally bomb. And I wouldn't understand. And I would ask, let's say, a friend of mine who was there with me, it worked, like this person would say, well, maybe it's just not funny. And I'm like, no, it got huge laughs yeah. yesterday. What's the difference? And it it would be really hard because mm-hmm. at that time, I didn't have somebody better than me kind of giving me yeah. feedback. You know, and it took a while to realize the audience typically doesn't know anything. Like once you start <laughs> learning... You're going to yeah. be very quickly, no matter what area it's in, you're going to be very quickly better than everyone who's observing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So you really, it's really important to find good people to get feedback from. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, a, that's the sort of best type of feedback is corrective feedback, where someone can not only spot your mistake, but tell you how to fix it. But in many areas of life, we just don't have that kind of feedback. And we can still learn from feedback that just sort of is like a thumbs up or a minus or a right. laugh or a heckle. Like you can still learn from that feedback, but it's very, you have to be very careful not to overreact to it. Like you said, you, you know, maybe the joke's funny, maybe it's not. Maybe you don't know yet, right? And I think sometimes people, especially when they have an emotional reaction to feedback, you know, someone tells them, oh, I don't like your business idea. And they're crushed. And they're like, well, I'm not going to go do it. But I mean, if you had interviewed 10 more people, maybe like four of them would have said, oh, that's cool. Some people say, man, like you get a bunch of different reactions. And so sometimes the key to overcoming feedback is just to get enough of it so that the individual pieces of feedback, you don't completely change your approach just because you hear some little negative reaction. Right. Or some that's really critical. Praise. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so okay, we're, we're, we're going through one principle at a time, we went through <laughs> sure. meta learning, and I'm really interested in the art one because it took you a month, and I saw, I see in the book <laughs> the difference between yeah. the, the beginning and the end, and it's super impressive. So principle two, focus, sharpen your knife. 
Yeah. So focus, the idea here is just that if you are going to learn things, you need to be able to devote not only time in your schedule, which all of us are super busy. I know a lot of people are listening. It's like, I don't have time for learning. Well, you're learning all the time. You, you're already spending time learning how to figure out your job, managing your relationships, raising your kids, getting through your work day. So we're already devoting time, but sometimes it's conflicted. You have eight other things going on, eight other things that you have to worry about. It's not just that you're trying to do your best to deliver this assignment to your boss, but you also have this deadline and you have this meeting to go to and all these other things. And so what focus is really about is giving yourself not only time. And so part of that is just scheduling the time, you know, committing yourself to, okay, I'm going to work on this for half an hour a day, or I'm going to work on this. And, you know, I've got this two week break and I'm going to really focus on learning this or, or, or doing something like that. But then also when you have the time, making sure that your attention is focused so that you, you know, you don't have the phone blaring, you don't have someone talking to you in one ear while you're also trying to pay attention to so, this thing you care so, about. So like for art, how many minutes or hours a day during the, that 30 day yeah. period did you focus on art? That project was uh, 25 hours a week for the month. So, so it about was about hours 100 a hours in or total. And like, yeah, that's about like five hours a day for, you know, I didn't do it on the weekend. It was like mm -hmm. doing it from, from that period of time. Now, I mean, obviously, if you can't do five hours a day, you could do an hour a day or you could do half an hour a day and, and get a similar sort of approach because you just have to modify it to your schedule, right? Yeah, I remember I, I read an interview with uh, Anatoly Karpov, who mm -hmm. was the world chess champion yeah. from like 1975 to 1984. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked him, how often do you study chess a day? Mm -hmm. And I thought he was going to say like 12 hours a day, but he said three hours a day. After that, it doesn't... Yeah. It, so probably he was just extremely focused those three hours a day, and but then mm -hmm. you have to keep up with your health. You have to do other things to keep your life energized so you have the energy to focus those three hours a day. Well, learning is hard work, and I think a mistake a lot of students do is they say, well, I'm not doing as well, or this goal is really important, so I'm going to study 12 hours a day. But because it's really hard to maintain that energy and concentration for 12 hours, they end up doing some activities that aren't really that beneficial for studying. So I think it's much better to decide what is the hard thing that you have to do, and even if it's a short period of time, really doing it, and then you know you go on and you do your other things, and you make progress with whatever you're learning. So I'd much rather encourage someone, you know, if you're going to study for a test, for instance, you know, do a practice exam. It's hard. It's difficult. You, you have to activate all the knowledge instead of spending three times as long, just reviewing your notes or retranscribing it or doing something that's less effective. So, okay. Principle three, directness goes straight yeah. ahead with, with, with the art. You did that by just drawing. You probably... You yeah. probably just drew. Jet, do, yeah, do drawing when you're speaking a language, speak a language. If you're trying to speak it, have conversations. But you have to be able to measure it because you have to know when you're plateauing. So you do something. So like you, you, you draw yeah. art and then you have some way of measuring, well, I was this percentage off. Or you play chess, you lose a game of chess. So you, you speak a language and a native speaker says, no, you didn't, you missed this word. I think te real situations tend to give you that kind of feedback. If you're in a real situation, you can even, like even if you're painting a picture or something, you have some sense of, is this better than the last one I did? So we were talking a little bit before about how difficult it is to get pure metrics in something like stand-up comedy, but that doesn't mean you can't get that feedback. It doesn't mean you can't see your progress. On the other hand, if you're just reading a book about telling jokes, I mean, where you don't know whether there's progress there. You don't know whether you're going there. Right. So directness has to be where you start learning pretty much anything. And I think where it's particularly useful and particularly potent is when the default or status quo is a kind of learning just from the book or learning just from a classroom where you don't have a lot of direct practice and the expectation is that you're going to do classroom learning or book learning for years maybe before you actually apply it. And so if you can hijack that process and bring some direct practice in near the start, you're going to be much better off than most people. I think that's, I think that's really critical. So like, uh, I mean, there's a million applications of that, but, uh, you know, obviously the best way to learn how to drive is to yeah. get behind the wheel and drive because yeah. it's, it's, Anything that puts you in a high pressure situation doing something mm -hmm. is going to be a better way to learn. And I, I feel like the more you dial up the pressure, the more you'll learn. Unless it's so much pressure, like you're not going to get in an airplane and fly it. That'll be <laughs> too high pressure and you'll crash. But, you know, so you talk about get into a flight simulator as quickly mm -hmm. as you can and then see. So, so, but, but I think dialing up the pressure as, as quickly as possible in, within a reasonable limit is, is important in terms of your directness. Yeah. Directness. I think adjusting the difficulty is a huge part of directness because 
I mean, if I said, okay, right now I'm going to take you to a particle accelerator at CERN and like do some quantum mechanics, I mean, it would be impossible for you. You wouldn't have any idea how to do it. And similarly, if I, you know, said, okay, we're going to go to Beijing, China right now, and you're going to stand up on stage and do your comedy act in Mandarin, you'd struggle. Oh, that'll laugh. People will laugh at that (laughs) a lot. So I think the challenge is often how do you get directness still at a level where you can get that feedback? So what you're talking about at intensity, I think it's related to this level of feedback that you want to get enough feedback so that you, if it's just thumbs up all the time, you're not learning anything. But if it's also, it's thumbs down all the time, you're not learning. And so often the key is, you know, for a lot of people learning a new language, the difficulty is um, that a lot of people avoid speaking because they don't feel like they're ready. And so they're like, well, I'm going to wait and I, I'm not, I can't speak. I don't know anything. And it's sort of showing how do you break it down so that yes, you can speak after maybe like an hour or two. Now you're not going to be, you know, giving great oration in, in a new language, but maybe you can say like a couple back and forth sentences. Maybe you can type something into Google Translate and like parrot it out. And just to, just to get that kernel of starting point of conversation of actually producing the sounds and actually hearing someone else and, and seeing it as that little base and starting point, I think is so important because yeah, for so many skills, just the, the where you actually have to practice it seems so far away, seems so difficult that we don't really know what the bridge is from where we are now to there. And so it must just be through tons of textbooks and classes and years of study. Yeah, or, or years of study. I think there's the whole, the whole idea of the 10,000 hour rule is that, oh, the reason I'm not great is because I've only put in a thousand hours. I've got 9,000 mm-hmm. more hours to go. Yeah. But for instance, again, it, seem, it seems like I always try to reconcile the 10,000 hour rule, which is again, K. Anders Erickson's mm-hmm. rule that after 10,000 hours of doing something, of with deliberate learning, you should have mastered it or be among the best in the world at it. Mm-hmm. But again, what if you have these shortcuts? What if what if somebody tells you right in the beginning, oh, put the eyes in the middle of the face instead of in the top <laughs> two thirds. Now mm-hmm. you don't have to spend a hundred hours of drawing and comparing with other figures to learn this heuristic. You just skipped a hundred hours. Is that a valid skipping of hours? <laughs> Yeah, I think, for, well, from my understanding of the deliberate practice research is kind of that this 10,000 hour rule is probably the idea behind it is just that experts tend to have accumulated lots of practice as opposed to the theory that they were just born good at it, which mm-hmm. is, I think is the thing that Erickson is sort of discounting. But when I when I did the research and looked at a lot of his stuff about deliberate practice, the idea is not, oh, he's, you know, just just put in 10,000 hours, doesn't matter what you do, and then that's going to make you an expert, but rather that plateaus are super common, that you can spend years doing a skill and not get much better. And so some of his examples are things like tennis players or golf players who just play for fun versus pro golfers, is that when you're just playing for fun, you tend to get better in the beginning when you really don't know how to golf, and then you get to some stable plateau and you tend not to improve. And so what's required is this deliberate practice, and the deliberate practice is in some ways, kind of unlearning some, you know, bad habits or sort of saying, well, you know, kind of how I was doing the drawing that I was doing this approach of tracing it and doing this. And then I kind of hit a plateau. And then it was like, I need a new method. I need a new sort of heuristic, or I need a new way of going about it. And so deliberate practice is about sort of not only just doing something a lot, but also breaking it apart and analyzing it. And one of the chapters I talk about drills is really this sort of complement to just doing something is how do I break it apart so that I can say, you know what, this is my problem is this specific thing. And let's work on getting really good at that and then bring it back to the the main thing that I'm trying to do. Right. I think the, so, so drilling is principle four. So, uh, I have some, I have some thoughts on this, but I'm curious again with, with art, how did you, how did you drill? Yeah. So I think one of, yeah. So with that, uh, process, I think there's, The way to think about it is that whenever you're doing a complicated skill like drawing, you're not just doing one thing, you're doing many things. So one of the things that I would be doing is trying to just approximately put the facial features. That was one of the things I was trying to do in this kind of drill. So one of the things I did is instead of doing some big elaborate sketch where I'm like, you know, trying to get the hair right and like getting some lighting effects and shadow and all these, all these other things that are important in a finished uh, portrait it would be, can I just put these features in the right location? So I would do these quick sketches where at first I was doing them with like, I think five minutes. And then I even did them just with one minute. And the idea was, can I see a picture and then quickly put the things in kind of roughly the right place? And this got me better at that sort of general skill of, am I putting things in roughly the right place? Is it roughly the right shape? Is it roughly the right thing? 
without having to spend, you know, for every repetition doing a whole portrait, doing, you know, getting all the hair right, getting all the little details and all those sorts of things that are also important, but they're a different subskill. They're a different so, so uh, what, aspect of it. When you sped it up like that, when you were trying to draw a face in, in one minute, and then later on you said, okay, now I'm going to take 20 minutes to draw the face. Did you find you were actually getting better? Yeah. And so part of it is that that's the interplay you need is that when you do a drill, you also need to go back and do the real thing to see, did I improve? Because sometimes what you do when you make a drill is that you've simplified it in some way, or you've eliminated one of the things that actually makes it difficult. So I did notice improvement in there, but to a point, as I mentioned, we had this plateau and then I had to do this Vitruvian studio course to really get better. But I think about this in terms of language learning that, you know, when you, the right way to do it is try to have little conversations with people and then you maybe go do some vocabulary, learn some vocabulary, maybe you practice some grammar, you do some of these sorts of things that you would do in a normal language class. But then you go back and you see, did that make an impact on my speaking ability? And if it didn't, then why not? Is it just because you're trying to learn it too early? Or are you trying to understand the subjunctive when you haven't mastered a five-minute conversation? Or is it because the way you're practicing it just doesn't transfer? So if you've learned something in a way that that's not actually what you're going to be doing when you're in the actual situation, you can get into these problems. So one of the examples I bring up in that chapter on directness is uh, that I'm not a huge fan of Duolingo. And the reason I'm not a huge fan of Duolingo is because one of the very typical exercises they'll do is they'll give you a sentence in, let's say, in English or let's say like Italian if you're learning that. And then they'll give you a word bank where you just tap with your finger the right words to make up that mm -hmm. sentence. So maybe there's five words in the sentence and they give you like nine words in the word bank. And the thing is, is that, yes, you are doing some practice there. This is a kind of drill, but tapping words out of a word bank is nothing like actually speaking. So my guess is that there's going to be a real difficulty transferring that unless you're doing just an enormous amount of Duolingo practice to actually get to that level. Whereas if you're doing something like you don't have the word bank and you just have to recall the whole sentence, well, now that's actually closer to what you might do in real life where you have to, okay, I want to say this, and now I have to just recall these words from memory. Well, again, it, it seems like dialing up the stakes in yeah. any, any part of this is going to help you skip the line a little bit more. It can definitely help. Yeah, definitely doing something that's more real, more difficult. Because often what happens when you simplify is you eliminate some of these difficulties. And the difficulties, getting over the difficulties is really the part of learning, right? And so if you eliminate all the difficulties, if you abstract and make it this simple picture, it can often be difficult to learn properly or transfer it because all the things that make it hard in real life are not there. Just like if you were driving a car and you were, you know, you're playing a video game or something and driving a car, it's not the same as driving a car in real life because, you know, it's, it's not completely around you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you know, you just use a joystick. It's okay if you go over the curb. Like there's all sorts of things that don't make it like driving a car in real life. So just because you're good at Mario Kart doesn't mean you're going to be a race car driver. So so you would uh, drill yourself by by kind of trying these exercises with drawing and then how would you then, like, let's say you were plateauing then, how would you go back and assess, okay, now I need to learn this other micro skill of drawing? Like, like you, yeah. I, I, think, I think what's kind of unspoken here so far is mm -hmm. that any skill that's hard and worth learning is really a combination of a bunch of micro skills that are smaller. So yeah. like you said, there's knowing where everything's on the face, but then there might be kind of drawing where the sun and the shade mm -hmm. hits the face and, you know, other things. I don't know. Yeah, so one of the things that I was doing in that process is that I usually did um, like a, a kind of a full portrait, especially in the beginning when I was spending about an hour on them in the morning, and then I would do kind of drills later in the day. So there was always that kind of cycle of like doing one and then doing the drawings. And it was usually a process of figuring out what is the thing that I'm not doing well. And you kind of have to guess a little bit there. Like you're sort of making estimates like maybe the problem's this. And then you go and you do some drill and you work on that for a little bit. And you go back and you're like, did that did that fix my problem? Or, or or, you know, maybe it's not that, maybe it's something else. And I think about this with other complex skills that, you know, I spend a lot more than a month working on, such as writing, that, you know, you write some things and you're like, you know, maybe my problem is that I'm not as good at research as I'd like to be. So you go off and you sort of improve your research skills. You sort of figure out, okay, what's a new process I could use for research? What's ways that I could, you know, do this and that. And then you go back and you say, did it improve my writing? And then you're like, well, maybe now my problem is that, you know, I'm too serious. I'm not funny enough. So then you start doing something else. And so the, the kind of attitude that I want to, portrays that it's not like there's one step-by-step -step answer, but that it's a constant process of, you know, try this, did it work? And then go back and do it. And that's sort of what the, the feeling of learning should be. And I like the idea of isolating skills as much mm -hmm. as possible. So for instance, let's say you said, oh, I'm drawing the face okay, but I can't seem to draw the nose. 
this is gonna sound weird, but I don't know, did you ever like just say, okay, I'm just gonna draw noses now? Yeah, I as did. The drills, and I'm I did just gonna do draw some of that. Yeah, yeah. eyes and just draw mouths, mm -hmm. and with, and then when you bring it all together, did that work? Yeah, that helped. I mean, I think sometimes what you're trying to improve is also uh, it's it's something more abstract too. So you know, one of the things I I was noticing is again, like once I started drawing, and then I noticed that you know, at the beginning, it's like, okay, maybe I'm consistently making them too wide. So that's something I just have to consciously adjust for that. Like I, I tend to make faces wider than they actually are. Or I tend to, like we said about the eye placement or something, but then once it's sort of random, like I'm just sort of, sometimes it's too wide, sometimes it's too narrow. I know that the problem is that I'm not accurate enough. So it was the question of what is a method I can use to sort of quickly before I finish the whole thing, tell whether or not I'm in the right ballpark or whether, no, no, this needs to be made more narrow. Or, so you start with things like, you know, you can even do this where you like hold the pencil out in front of your eye and you go like this with one eye and then you sort of measure and like, okay, it's about, you know, a third more tall than it is wide. And then that's your starting point. And so you also experiment with these little kinds of methods and stuff. And, you know, part of the meta learning research is trying to uncover these methods because if you are trying to learn drawing, these are all things that, you know, painters and draw artists have been struggling with for hundreds of years. So methods exist and, and these sort of techniques can exist. And so if you were learning a language and you're like, I just can't remember any of this vocabulary, then you start digging around and you're like, oh, there's some like mnemonics or there's, you know, flashcard algorithms or there's other things that can help me with that problem. Or, you know, if I, I don't understand this concept in this subject, it's like, okay, well, maybe I can use this technique to help understand it better. So you build this library. I mean, you mentioned towards the end of the book, uh, the Polgar sisters. Yeah. So that's these three sisters uh, who from, from basically from birth, they're, they're, their dad decided they're going to be great at chess. Yeah. And he developed a very specific, very focused method of them learning chess. And one of the things is he, he published a book. It's this huge thick book called chess and it's just 5,334 problems, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll, he'll categorize them. So it might be like, you know, a hundred problems where it's checkmate with the Bishop, a mm -hmm. hundred problems where it's mate in three, a hundred problems where it's what's called an end game, like where mm -hmm. there's just a few pieces on the board. And how do you play? And so those were like very, he would isolate very specific situations and essentially drill them over and over. Like these were the positions he used to train them. And he would he would he would isolate these specific skills on the chessboard and just drill them over and over on it. Yeah. And, and the goal was they had to do it as fast as possible. And he even mm -hmm. says in the book, if you can't solve the problem, don't worry about it. Don't spend more than a minute or two, then mm -hmm. just look at the solution. Yeah, and I think that's something really valuable because anyone who's, well, I know you've learned chess and you're, you're quite good at it, but anyone who's learned chess is like, okay, you need to master all the common end games. So when you're starting to learn chess, maybe the goal is just to play and understand how the pieces move and spot normal patterns like, oh, I probably shouldn't have put my queen there and now it's gone, you know, things like that in the beginning. And then later you start to maybe learn, okay, there are a set of, you know, it's a finite set of things that any good chess player would just know automatically, okay, I've got, you know, you got a king and a pawn and I got a king and a rook, I should just win. And like, what's the way to win? And like, what are the situations where if I make a mistake, then now, okay, now I've lost. And so um, that's an example of where if you were playing a game and you start to find, well, I feel like I'm winning, I should be winning. And then I kind of screw it up right near the end. I'd be like, all right, let's just go off and, you know, master all these specific end game puzzles. And that's going to be a lot better than just playing tons of games because you might not encounter all of them. Like right. there's, there's, you know, there's hundreds of these different end game positions and you might have to play thousands of games before you encounter one of them. And then even then you might screw it up, whereas you could just go through them systematically. And so this is similar to a lot of other skills where you kind of figure out, okay, this is my general category of problem that I'm kind of making mistakes here. And then you go and you break it down to like, okay, I'm going to work on my end game or I'm going to work on this aspect and really master it. And then you bring it back to playing the games. And, you know, hopefully near the end, when you get to certain combinations, it's like, oh, I just know this is the right way to you know, move these pieces and then I win. I'll, I'll, I'll give you two examples in stand-up comedy uh, where I tried to isolate different skills. Mm -hmm. So one is I was having trouble tightening up the jokes, like getting to the punchline yep. as quickly as possible. So I would go on the subway and do stand-up on the subway and then just switch cars at each stop because you have an unfriendly audience mm -hmm. and they're not going to laugh unless you're just as tight as possible, unless yeah. you get to the laugh as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And even that, and even then I was horrible and they wouldn't <laughs> laugh, but at least I tried to isolate that skill. Then this next technique I haven't done, but I've suggested it to people and it's, it's blasphemous to actually give this technique. <laughs> it, um, but I tell people 
go to an open mic where it doesn't really matter. The, the, yeah. It's actually low stakes in terms of the audience because the audience is is just mostly other comedians or a very tiny audience and steal completely steal all the material like get just the best material from your favorite stand-up comedian mm -hmm. and and do it yeah and and then what you're isolating you you know the material is good because it's your favorite material mm -hmm. from your favorite stand-up comedian so you're isolating the skill of being on stage and having confidence on stage and having presence and maybe doing a little you know feeling out the crowd so you're 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 very accurately isolating that skill it's considered blasphemy because you're not supposed to steal other people's material mm -hmm. but i and that's what people say to me but i always say look this is not a netflix special you're just doing an open mic at a random place no one's gonna punish you for this and it is the best way to kind of you know separate out the comedy itself from being on stage and and having that experience of being on stage well it's really funny that you mentioned that technique because that's something that comes up a lot and in our culture we have a real like copying is seen as being inferior, that if you copy, that you must not be a master. And so one of the things that surprised me is that if you go back again in history, when you don't have this cultural bias, that people copied all the time. And some of the greatest people spent the first part of their work just copying what other people did. So uh, Vincent van Gogh, who I cover in one of the chapters, was like relentless. Like there were certain paintings, like um, uh, Millier's the, the Sower, this this picture of this, you know, peasant sowing seeds. I think Vincent van Gogh probably did this painting like a hundred times. Like he was just drawing it, drawing it, drawing it, painting it, painting it, painting it. And he loved this painting and he was thinking, well, this is how I'm going to get good. And so there is a certain tendency for us to think you should be um, doing original work from day one, that like you should have your own material, that if you're writing, that you should have your own ideas, that everything should be fresh. And I do admit like outright plagiarism is probably not the best move in a lot of industries, especially if you're not being forthcoming about it. If, if you're presenting yeah, to the wider is it, is public this is your work. as finished work, but in the learning process, yeah. you're either private or semi-private yeah. and you're learning. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people would benefit from uh, doing something again in a transparent way. We're not trying to advocate anything unethical for people here, but in a transparent way, just recognizing that that is often the road to learning is if you can imitate what someone's done, that is often you will learn pieces of how they do it. And so for writing, for instance, if you want to get better at writing, you know, take some essay that someone else has written and see if you can like, without, you know, looking at it, try to reconstruct it and then, then compare what you did and see, okay, what is it that this person did better than what I did? And then you can also maybe go a step further and say, okay, well, I'm not going to write, you know, the exact version of this person's article, but I'm going to maybe try to write in their style. And then that also causes you to notice what is it about their style? What is the thing that you like? And so you're not just, you're not, you're not stealing material now, but you're stealing kind of a higher level abstract idea. And that's really what great artists do is that they look at other people's work and they're not, you know, just copy and pasting the substance of it, but they're figuring out why does this work? Why is this, you know, successful? So when you, you know, you're a stand-up comedian, you watch some, you know, Dave Chappelle, Jerry Seinfeld or someone do a bit why does it work? What is it that, you know, what is the sort of the higher level idea that makes that funny or that makes that work? Or if you're a writer, you know, why does Malcolm Gladwell's essay so compelling? Like, what is he doing that, you know, maybe you're not doing in your writing? Or, you know, why is this person's approach so much more successful than yours? And I think copying is a definitely an underrated strategy for, for getting Yeah, because I think, I think when you copy, you, you, again, because you're doing it, you're mm -hmm. feeling things in your body that you might not feel just by looking at it. So, um, uh, like Dave Chappelle, I could watch a Dave Chappelle special mm -hmm. and I could say, Oh, that was funny. Like he made an interesting yeah. observation and I laughed. But then if you actually try to mimic mm -hmm. what he's doing and even look at the mirror while you're, or make a video of yourself and mimic what he's doing. And then you compare your video with his, you, you realize, Oh, he's modulating his voice a lot yeah. more in these weird ways or he's making these jerky kind of movements yeah. that are sort of funny that i wasn't doing mm -hmm. and you wouldn't notice that if you weren't if you didn't actually do it yourself if you didn't try to mimic if you didn't try to do a cover of his joke yeah and you know what i think a lot of us we all consume the works of like extremely great artists and thinkers all the time like when you watch a movie you've watched movies by the best people in the world you've seen stand-up acts by the best people in the world you've read read articles and books by the best writers in the world and so there is a certain sense that as a consumer of media that you kind of get it in a way 
that maybe you don't realize just how much work was put into it that, you know, this writer that maybe he chose this exact word in this plate, like it wasn't an accident that this was planned out very deliberately. And I, I think sometimes you can see this with, uh, if you hear, if you get the privilege of hearing, let's say like a famous director, like talk about their work, you realize how many layers of thinking go into every single little detail that went into it that maybe you were unaware of just passively consuming it. And so I think sometimes when you start to create things, that's when you start to notice the richness of, of, you know, people who are really good at you notice a lot of details that maybe you wouldn't have noticed before just because, you know, and you just, it takes like a, you know, a couple days maybe of concentrated effort to read a book, but maybe it takes a year or a couple years with the research to write a book. And so there's so much more going into things than, than we typically expect. Yeah, you make a great example on the writing with like Malcolm Gladwell. Mm -hmm. You know, he writes these nonfiction, a lot of people write nonfiction essays every day in yeah. every magazine in the world. Somehow his nonfiction essays sort of rise to the top. Yeah. But he has, but if you literally, if you take one of his stories and you write them out word for word, you see that, oh, he has this interesting way of starting a story and then making, mm -hmm. he doesn't finish it, then he makes a point, then he starts a new story. It takes a long time to get through each story while he's making points along the way. And it's very uh, instructive to see, he's got a very particular style. Oh, absolutely. And you wouldn't necessarily know that if you're just reading the article. Mm -hmm. You finish the article and you say, oh, that's an interesting point. Hockey players are born in <laughs> the winter, yeah. not later in the year. And and people focus on the slightly older kids when they're training them. Mm -hmm. But the way he writes it is like, you know, so so and so's, you know, in the Hall of Fame. This guy's in the Hall of Fame. This guy's in the Hall of Fame. They were all born in February. Yeah. And then he goes on and then he's yeah. there's a line. And then he goes on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like a, this weird cliffhanger approach while he's building up his argument. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's part of, you know, not just copying, but just studying other people. Uh is is so important. So we're talking about, you know, ultra learning. And so some people will think, oh, this is, you know, how to study for tests, but this is really how do you, you know, get good at things that matter in your life is how do you deconstruct, you know, something that looks magical that someone's doing? What is the effort that goes into it? Yeah. And then um your, you know, principle five, we skipped over principle five when <laughs> we talked about feedback on principle six. Yeah. Principle five is retrieval. I feel this works more in like things like language development, maybe math, uh, you know, things where there are things to remember. Mm -hmm. A little bit chess, actually, because you're trying to remember oh, yeah, openings and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how often is retrieval important for ultra learning? Yeah, retrieval was a principle that I didn't, it, it was one of the ones that it was only after seeing the research that it was like, oh, this has to be in the book because the research is both extremely clear and also that this is not something, certainly a lot of students don't do. So one of my favorite studies from the book is uh, Jeffrey Karpicki and Janelle Blunt took students and separated them into multiple groups. And one of them, they got to do repeated reviews. So they just said, okay, you just read it and you just read it over and over and over again until you got it. And then another group, they told to do free recall, which is where you read it once and you shut the book and you try to remember as much as you can. So recall, meaning you have to remember it and free, meaning there aren't prompts or questions or flashcards, let's say. And what they found is right after you do this and you ask them how well have you learned the information, the people who've done repeated review give themselves really high marks. They say, you know what, I learned it really well. But when you actually test them, it's the people who did free recall that give themselves, you know, that actually score well on the test. And one of the things that this sort of interested me is that how many of us get in this situation where you think you're going to remember something and you don't. So the, the, my favorite example of this is how often have you been at a party where someone tells you their name and you forget it like in like six seconds that that name is just evaporated from your brain. And the reason why is that when I tell you that this person's name, it's usually a normal name, right? And so your brain's like, oh yeah, that's a normal name. That's easy, right? But it doesn't mean that you'll be able to recall it. It just means that you feel familiar with that name. And so one of the things that I thought was so important with this is not just for learning things where you have to remember stuff, but even think about the last book that you read. You know, if you've read a book, how well would you be able to, you know, repeat the main themes of the book, some of the details, some of the specific advice? It's usually surprisingly little. And so the idea of retrieval practice is whenever you want to be able to recall things, when you ever want to be able to remember them, not just recognize it if you saw it again, then you should be practicing retrieval. And so certainly for every student who's studying on a test, who's listening to this right now, they need to be doing retrieval practice, which is where you are quizzing yourself with the book shut rather than just looking it over and highlighting things and retranscribing your notes. But even people who aren't taking tests, retrieval is important because 
if there's anything that you want to actually be able to remember. So this podcast conversation right now, I mean, once it's done, you probably be best off pausing it and just taking like a minute or two to just sort of, okay, what did they talk about? What can I remember of what they talked about? Because the act of trying to remember is going to be how you actually retain things long-term. Well, that that's so interesting you mentioned this podcast because I, so I only have people on the podcast such as yourself yeah. when I want to learn something from them. So yeah. I read your book. Mm -hmm. It's not just that I want to promote your book. That's just <laughs> the excuse to get yeah, yeah. you on the podcast, but then I want to learn new things. But here's the problem I have. So I prepare by, let's say, reading the mm -hmm. one or more books that you've done, watch other interviews and so on. Then I have the podcast. Then if I don't almost immediately after write down, like let's say you go mm -hmm. and now I have some spare time, I have to always write down 10 things that I learned from the podcast. Mm -hmm. Else, even an hour later, someone might ask me, hey, who did you have on your podcast today? I might not even remember who I had on my podcast yeah. that day because things, I don't know how the brain works, but I always say, it must be because I loaded everything up in my short-term memory right before the podcast. Mm -hmm. Then I had the podcast. Then when it was over, I didn't take the time to write what I learned. It didn't have time to move back into long-term memory and it just gets flushed out. Absolutely. And that's a big problem is that for a lot of us, we encounter some information and then we only remember like the, the vaguest details of it. And so if there's something that's important that you're reading or listening to in your life, which I'm sure there is if you're, if you're listening to this podcast right now, one of the best things you can do is just, you know, after you're done listening to something, just take out a piece of paper and just try to write down what you remember. Now, the, the ultimate best way to do it, if it's super important for you to do it, is to try to write down what you remember, not just right after, but maybe a day after, a week after, a month after. But I mean, that's in a more elaborate system for things that are super important. But if you can't do all that, just even right after you're done, do that. So when I was doing research for this book, it was interesting because I was like, oh, I should do more of this because I'm trying to remember all these little studies and research papers and ideas when I'm going to be writing a chapter. And so after I would print off the journal articles and then I would put a few sheets of loose leaf in between each one. And so after I finished it, it would be like, okay, close it. And then I'll see what I can recall. What were the main points? What were the things that I might use in my chapter or might use in this, this book? And it does help you remember things better. And so retrieval is just definitely a very, uh, very important technique whenever memory is conserved or really whenever you need to have something at your fingertips and not just be able to look it up later. Well, so obviously though, many of the, the principles here you've developed while engaging in some of these ultra learning projects that you, that you accomplished, whether it was art or languages or computers or whatever. Uh, what did you, in the process of writing this book, what additional thing about ultra learning did you learn that you didn't know before, even though you had gone through all these ultra learning projects? Oh yeah. So many things. I think, um, again, I mentioned a lot of the research on retrieval. Like I knew that you were supposed to do active recall, but it was just amazing to me, like how clear that that was in the research that it was, you know, you, you get much better effects from doing that. The feedback one was really interesting for me because as I mentioned before, I was going into it thinking, you know, all feedback is good all the time. Everyone needs to get more feedback. And then you look at the research and show that, you know, it can have all these kind of complicated effects so that sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it's not. And I think another set of research that kind of surprised me was how clear the research is on transfer as well. So we were talking about the principle of directness. And I mean, again, it sounds fairly obvious that you need to do the thing that you want to get good at to learn, but how many of us, you know, we, you know, take classes or we read a book and then we're saying like, yep, that's good. I know that I will be able to use this later. And then often we can't. And so for, for me, uh, often it was little things like that that just sort of surprised me. Like the, the transfer literature is just, it's really a, a fascinating thing, really a hundred years of showing why a lot of things we learn in school just, you know, don't make an impact in well, the real world. Well, again, because I don't think, I think you can transfer from a similar domain to another similar domain. Mm -hmm but sitting in school is not the same as doing. Yeah. So they're not similar domains really. So, and mm -hmm. I think, I think the other thing about transfer, like I was talking to someone about this the other day in 1998, I play a lot of poker. And so mm -hmm. in poker, you learn skills about statistics, probability, when to make money decisions, how to manage your money. Mm -hmm. And then I started investing and I lost all my money. And <laughs> I oh, asked, sorry. I later on, I was wondering why didn't I just transfer those skills from poker to investing? And much later I was able to do that. But I think you have to be consciously aware, oh, now I need to transfer these yeah. skills. You have to you have to also tell yourself skills from this domain. You can't assume they're going to transfer. You have to tell yourself 
Here's how they transfer. Here's how one skill maps to another. So there's some really interesting research on transfer because obviously this is what educators want is they want transfer. They want to teach something in a classroom and then you go out in the real world and you apply it. So there's been a lot of effort and a lot of ink spilled on how to get this. And so a couple of the findings is one is that transfer tends to be better the more expertise you have. So when you just start learning something, that's when your transfer is probably the worst. And so you don't make even really obvious leaps and connections. And this is also kind of obvious because if you think about it, the people who study transfer, they see the connection between two things. So they're able to transfer these two things because if they didn't see the connection, then there would be no paradox. There'd be no problem to study at all just because well, obviously these two things aren't related, right? Mm. And so it's clear that once you get some expertise, you are able to see connections between things. So if you get really good at poker, you do start to see poker analogies in regular things because you've built up enough layers of abstraction to start seeing those. And then the second thing you point out is very right that often transfer needs to be deliberate. So you need to be thinking, how does this apply? You need to be doing that mental work to make the bridge. So if you don't make that bridge, if you don't actually connect one thing to the other thing, uh, it will just be inert. You'll have that knowledge somewhere, but it just won't make an impact on the thing that you're actually trying to get good at. So, so like your friend who was, so you, you, you mentioned a friend in this book who um, was, he was very good at music. He was a music performer mm -hmm. and he was good at it and he wanted to get better at public speaking. Yeah. And he figured that there would be some transfer in performance ability, but there mm -hmm. wasn't. He was just a horrible public speaker at first and then he became, yeah. he, he got in the top 10 of the world's public speaking mm -hmm. championships. But... Do you think there could have been, why couldn't he transfer at least stage presence? So when you're performing mm -hmm. in music, you have some presence on stage. Yeah. Now, maybe the downside is you're usually with a group, so you're, the stage presence is diluted, whereas when you're public speaking, all the focus is on you, which is very different. Mm -hmm. But could there have been some transfer that he missed? Oh, I'm sure there's probably some transfer. I think, again, part of the challenge is just that when you, often when you're doing a new skill, like let's say, again, going from being a guitarist in his case and a singer to being a public speaker, part of it is also just that when you are a musician, you you have a certain comfort zone with your stage presence. So I'll give a good example. If you ever see actors and you have to see them give speeches, often actors are not particularly good public speakers, even though you would think that they would automatically be good public speakers. What is their job is you know, is more involved in public speaking because you have to not only deliver some memorized script, but you also have to be doing a bunch of things and pretending to be in a certain situation at the same time. So why wouldn't someone who's a great actor automatically be a good public speaker? And I think that it's probably related to this thing that a lot of the skills they learn for being successful as an actor, they get comfortable in that situation. And then when they stand on stage and it's not them playing pretend, it's not them being in theater, but it's them actually delivering a line from themselves. And this now they're not in that comfort zone and they're not able to do it. So I think that there probably is some transfer between music and public speaking and stand-up comedy and acting, but some of that has to be done deliberately. But then also there's the idea that just, you know, it takes time in order for that transfer to be fully realized and for you to start really drawing those abstract lessons. And so if you want to start public speaking, you should start public speaking and not, you know, read a book on public speaking or do so, something that's completely unrelated. So let's say though you're public speaking and yeah. you have this sense that, hey, I should be able to transfer the stage presence that I learned from performing mm -hmm. music thousands of times yeah. to public speaking. And somehow I'm not, I'm like nervous. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't have any stage presence. Somehow, yeah. uh, How would you get good at the skill of transfer in that case? Yeah, so I think some of it is just sort of trying to trying to see what is it that you're doing. Because often when we do things, we just think about the kind of surface layer of, of what we're doing. So the best example I can think of is, is actually with chess. That if you're playing chess, often what you can think of is, is fairly straightforward things like, okay, these are the way the pieces move and this is how you know a game is typically played. And so if you go to play a completely different game, like let's say poker, it might at first not seem like they're that related at all. And it takes a while for you to think, well, what was it about getting good at chess? Or what was it that I had to do in chess? And so some of those things might be, you know, making decisions under time pressure, or it might be things like, you know, thinking about what is an opponent thinking, that sort of mental simulation act. That is probably pretty similar, and there's probably something that transfers, but it may not be automatic in that new domain. And so you have to think about, well, what is it that could transfer that I am good at doing? So if you were the musician, it might be, you know, how do I you know, manage the emotions of the audience, which is going to be going out through time. And so think about like, well, what is it that I'm doing when I'm playing music and how can I bring that musicality to my public speaking? But definitely it, it doesn't seem like this is an automatic ability. Hmm. Yeah, so like you have to think about it a lot and really mm -hmm. you have to almost get, 
Like if you were to transfer, let's say your, your skill now in drawing portraits to, uh, let's say photography, mm -hmm. I, 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 what would you first think of if you were going to say, okay, I'm going to use this principle of transfer to, uh, get a head start on photography. Yeah. So I think the main ways that it would influence me is sort of at the meta level of learning the skill as opposed to the mechanics of what I'm doing, because often the problems you're trying to solve with drawing are not the same as the ones with photography and particularly in the challenge that I was doing that photography is a lot of composing and staging. Whereas, you know, drawing is all drafting. It's about how do you make, you know, given that you've got this setup, how do you sort of render it accurately? Whereas the photo will take care of that for you. So it's a lot of it is like, what makes the photo interesting and what makes this, you know, good lighting in these kinds of conditions. And so for me, I think probably what I would be transferring is more the meta sort of skill of, okay, what was the process that I used to get good at drawing? And it was, okay, I need to do repetition. I need to probably invest a little bit in learning some methods, but just enough to get to this point so that I can take a bunch of pictures. Probably need some kind of feedback system. So it would be good to even just like start thinking about what would be the way that I could get better feedback with my photography. So maybe one of the things is you take some pictures of some subject and you look at some pictures that a professional has taken and then you sort of compare them. What do I like better about what he or she did and what, what did I do that? And so that's not at the level of like obviously drawing and moving my hand with the pencil is not anything like, you know, doing this with the camera, but at the higher level, at the higher level of thinking about, okay, well, I'm going to have to take a lot of pictures, maybe thousands to get good at it. I'm going to have to learn a bit of theory about how the camera works. I'm going to probably want to benchmark myself against. So there's, there's these sort of abstract ideas, but it's not automatic. So it could be very easy. You could get a photography and just be like, oh, whoa, what's, this is nothing to do with this thing that I've learned or, or it's not obvious how they transfer. Yes. So interesting. I, I really think transfer is such an important principle because we've all, not all, but mm -hmm. many of us have spent some degree of hours getting good at something. And then when we try to get good at something new, we've spent zero hours, but it'd be great to get a head start by finding the similarities between something we've already put the work into and bringing it into this new domain. So for instance, I've done a lot of public speaking. Mm -hmm. I was always trying to figure out how do I bring that into stand-up comedy, which is a form mm -hmm. of public speaking, albeit much different. Or when I was playing, I don't know why this phone doesn't turn off. <laughs> uh, when I, when I was, I play, learn how to play chess and get very good at chess. And then when I learned a new game like poker mm -hmm. or go or backgammon, you know, it was, you know, I had spent so many hours studying chess. It was a little bit easier for me to learn and yeah. master these other games by borrowing from the, the 10,000 hours I had put yeah. into one thing. Well, so one of the things I think you're pointing out, which is very valuable, is that often it's not even so much about transfer, but about leveraging a skill that you have to learn another skill. So some of that is just sort of consciously looking for overlap. So one of the examples is uh, Scott Adams, who did the Dilbert cartoons, made his whole thing that like he was uh, an engineer with an MBA who had this kind of previous corporate life plus a cartoonist. Now he wasn't the best engineer, the best manager. He wasn't the best cartoonist, but this overlap allowed him to create Dilbert, which is sort of a, you know, commentary on office politics. That's harder for someone who's a, you know, cartoonist at a, at a newspaper who doesn't have maybe that life experience, doesn't really know all the funny little inside jokes about office life that, you know, might be missing. And so it's similarly, you can make this sort of conscious effort that it's not the same as just, oh, I'm going to automatically be good at this skill, but how can I leverage the things I'm already good at? So one of the examples I talk about in the book is that when I started learning Chinese, I already knew programming. And so I, I actually made this software thing that would use this learner resource and automatically like go through and turn it into these flashcards that I was using. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, this doesn't mean that I know Chinese because of this, but I was able to get an advantage over someone who doesn't know programming because I leveraged that previous strength. So I think the more that you learn different things, you can start to not only learn these meta tools, but you can even directly use one skill towards another. So even, you know, maybe you have some skills in public speaking about you know, controlling the speed of your delivery or your stage presence, or even just, you know, how you overcome stage fright that, you know, can later transfer to stand-up comedy. Well, well, you know, you bring up stage fright and, and psychology in general is important in learning because mm -hmm. again, anything worth learning, as you mentioned, you're going to suck at, at first, <laughs> otherwise Probably, yeah. everybody would be the best in the world yeah. at everything. And you've got, you know, it's right at that phase where you need feedback where the feedback could have a negative effect on you that you have to 
overcome the negative psych, you know, the, the negative feeling like, oh, I'm never going to get good at this. Or this was just, this was such a horrible, disappointing experience. I just, I'm tired of learning this. You know, let's say you're trying yeah. to learn, you know, poker and you play, you, you think you're getting really good and you go to a tournament and you lose $5,000 in one <laughs> hand and you, because you made this big mistake, it's so horribly disappointing. Mm -hmm. Then you have to look back and say later, okay, that was a learning experience, but you have to have the psychology to do that. Yeah. And I think one of the big things about a lot of learning skills is that we build up the fear in our mind more than the reality of it. And so obviously losing a lot of money in a poker hand is not great when that happens to you. But the best example I can think of is just language learning that I've, I've talked to people who, you know, they spend years studying it, but they don't actually speak with people because they're afraid of sounding awkward or they're afraid of this person dismissing them or doing this kind of thing. But then when you actually go out and do it and you tell people, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Like I'm trying to learn this language. I'm trying to learn it by speaking. And maybe I even have a little project to not speak in English right now. It's amazing how supportive people are. And so sometimes the thing that you're afraid of is more your imagination of what might go wrong rather than what's actually happening. And so part of this whole getting feedback and directness it's related to that because at least if you're going to be feeling bad about something, it's going to be a real thing, not something you've built up in your head. And for a lot of us, the reasons we don't learn things or pursue things that we care about or go for that job opportunity or start that business is because of these imagined things, you know, these imagined things that are going to like be holding us back and not real, actual, concrete experiences of, of failure. So uh, let me see what principles here. Uh, yeah, principle eight, intuition. Uh, what did you, what do you actually mean by that? Yeah. So the idea behind intuition is twofold. So one, I wanted to describe how do people who seem to have almost a magical ability to solve difficult problems, what is going on kind of under the hood, so to speak, so that it's not magic. It's actually just, you know, how your brain learns and that they are sort of at a further end of like, we were talking about 10,000 hours, but they're at a further end of sort of accumulating practice and experience. And then the second part was that if you're dealing with difficult subjects that are hard to wrap your head around, things like physics, things like math, things like computer programming, languages, lots of things where part of the difficulty is just like, I have even no idea what's going on here. How do you break down that? How do you break down the process of understanding so that something that seems super confusing to you can nonetheless be broken down into, well, if I just follow these step by step by step, I will understand it. And so the person that I covered in that chapter was Richard Feynman, who's been sort of a bit of a hero for me in learning because not only was he just clearly a genius, but also even his colleagues were impressed at how well he did things. And unlike a lot of people who are, you know, geniuses that we have no idea how they did things, he actually describes in a lot of detail how he was able to do some of these things that people thought were basically magic tricks. And what it's clear is that not only was he very smart, but also that he had just accumulated a lot of patterns in math and physics from hard work. And this was what allowed him to perform a lot of these feats. So this idea of intuition is both sort of like to make you feel more comfortable about, well, if I wanted to, you know, learn physics or I wanted to learn some difficult conceptual subject, that there's a roadmap to do that, that it's, you know, it does take work, but you can get better at it. But then also things like, you know, the Feynman technique, which I, I named after him, which is a tool for getting, you know, getting past those, those obstacles of understanding. Like, like it seemed like in your description of him, it, it he built up such a, a catalog of experiences in his mm -hmm. physics and, and math that someone would present a problem to him. He would say, Oh, that's like this situation. Mm -hmm. And here's how I would solve it in this situation. And he was able to immediately apply it to this new situation. And that happens also in, in chess, like, so there's this theory that you build, you know, that a chess grandmaster builds, uh, chunks. So he doesn't, yeah. he see, he doesn't see 64 squares on a chess board. He sees three or four chunks mm -hmm. and then he knows what to do. When I see these three or four chunks, I know what to do. Or, and, and so a grandmaster might have a hundred thousand chunks in his memory. Mm -hmm. A master might have 10,000 and an amateur might have nothing. Yeah. And so the chunking idea I think is really valuable because again, when I know you've played chess, so you're, you're, you know, better than this, but a lot of people think, well, the way that a grandmaster is able to perform so much better than a novice is that they're thinking through it the same way. They're just, you know, running all the calculations and thinking like 12 moves ahead. And that's almost never the case. And in fact, they don't say that grandmasters tend not to be, unless it's a very like particular line where all the moves are forced or something like this, where you have to do X, Y, and Z they're usually thinking not with so much more brain power than a normal person is. 
The difference is, like you said, is that they have all these patterns stored in memory. So the best example I had of this is, is just that this is not something that's just exclusive to grandmasters. This is that everyone has chunks and we have many, many, many of them. This is just how your brain works. And so the best example I think is that if I listed out the letters, um, let's say FMC, BBI, and IAA, and then I got, you know, if you were listening to this at home and, and I wanted you to repeat it, it might be difficult. But if I said those letters in this order, FBI, MBA, CIA, you'd have no problem remembering it. Mm -hmm. And that's because FBI, MBA, and CIA are chunks that you, you store them as one pattern in your brain. And so manipulating FBI, CIA, and MBA is much easier than manipulating those nine letters. And similarly, these chunks can be even more elaborate because it's not just that you know those letters in FBI. You also know that it's the Federal Bureau of Investigation and that they wear dark suits and that they're kind of police officers. And you have all these movies and background references. And so there are as many, many patterns associated with this kind of one concept. And so what you're doing when you're learning is that when you start a subject, you don't have any of these patterns yet. And so everything seems really confusing because it's like the string of letters that I presented to you before, that you see someone who's a physicist and you see this formula, and to you, it's like those letters. But to him or to her, it is something that they have internalized these patterns so they know actually what's going on here and they can see a picture that you can't. And so the chess players and chess masters know things like pins and forks and you know they're like oh you castled queenside and kingside and this has this implication for the board and they know all of these things from experience and also from you know maybe learning some theory and stuff as well and these chunks form these sort of basic building blocks for how you solve these problems and so the idea of intuition is that what you're often trying to do when you're approaching a new domain is you're trying to accumulate these patterns from real experience so that something that seems really magical that someone else can do is really just that they have enough patterns that it makes sense to them and it's obvious. So, so what, what do you actually think of the 10,000 hour rule? Like, so obviously mm -hmm. let's say 10,000 hours is not so specific. You know, even Anders Ericsson says it's not necessarily 10,000 hours. It's just in each domain, it's a little bit different, yep. but those are really the hours to be like the best mm -hmm. in the world. But for, for many of the things you're trying to learn, you're just trying to learn them. You're not mm -hmm. trying to be the best in the world. You're trying yeah. to be basically better than people who don't know the skill. You you want to be able to say you have the skill. Oh, yeah. And so, so what's, is it a hundred hours before you're in the top 95%, you know, the top 5%? Is it, you know, if you were to try to math, mm -hmm. you know, make it mathematical like that. Oh yeah. I think it really depends on what you're trying to learn. Like there's some skills that I think that you could learn relatively quickly, uh, if you approach it the right way. And so my idea is just that I think that instead of the hours, I try to think of what you're doing with your mind when you're learning. And I know that sounds really abstract, but what you're doing with your mind, I think is what makes the difference. And so again, it's from the same research that kind of in inspired this 10,000 hours is that again, getting stuck plateaus where you don't get better. And it's just, you just kind of stay mediocre for a long period of time. But these are super common and they're common because very often we get in situations where, you know, our natural instincts to learn, they get stuck and they get stalled. And so what I've, you know, really been devoting myself to is not like saying, okay, you should be able to do this in X number of hours, but what kind of things need to happen in order for you to learn this and how can you, you know, avoid both getting stuck, but also make some things a little bit more efficient. And so, you know, things like directness are very important because then you're not just learning knowledge and then hopefully transferring it, in which case you might lose a lot of it. You're applying it right away so that everything new that you learn is relevant and it's kind of at your fingertips. And things like feedback where you don't just make the same mistake for years and years, you get corrections on that. Or things like drill where instead of, well, you're doing 18 things at once and so you're never getting really better at them, you, you focus on each one of those 18 in order and so you get better at those things so that when you come back and do the whole skill, it builds up. So all of these things come together. And so, you know, really, I think the way I like to think about it is instead of the 10,000 hour rule, instead of, you know, you ought to be able to learn this in this amount of time. What I kind of want to give people is not more certainty about how much time to take, but less certainty because so many of us have internalized, I can't learn this, or this is the only way to do it, or this requires this much time. And I want people to say, you know what, maybe you don't know how much time it takes. Maybe that you don't know what you can and can't do and use that sort of uncertainty to kind of open up possibilities for, for what you might be able to accomplish. And, and how, and, and, and again, how much do you think is the role of shortcuts? So again, yeah. like in your drawing example, this one rule, put the eyes 
halfway in the face as opposed yeah. to two thirds up. If 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 you learn that just by someone telling you that, you actually learn it. Like it's mm -hmm. a simple rule. You can learn it. You start drawing. You're only going to put them fifty yeah. percent up. But if if you're just learning by drilling over and over and comparing and getting feedback, it might take you, uh, you know, an extra ten hours to to learn that one simple rule. And yeah. and, and I want to bring up the example you bring up in the book. This guy Nigel uh, Richards. I think Nigel Richards. Yeah. Yeah. He he won the um, French Scrabble Championship. And yeah. He didn't know a word of French. We well, couldn't speak French. Couldn't he speak he French. certainly knew enough words to put them on the board. But but, but yeah. that's the interesting thing. He yeah. maybe didn't like a lot of people. A lot of people have naive under understanding, a naive understanding of every domain they're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. So somebody with a good vocabulary might automatically think, "Oh, I'm going to be good at Scrabble." Mm -hmm. But that but good vocabulary actually is not necessary at all to be good at Scrabble, as this guy Nigel probably proves. He probably doesn't have a good vocabulary in French, but there are shortcuts if you know all the two-letter words. That's mm -hmm. a big shortcut because yeah. there's there's some very unobvious ones like in English. X I X U Q I yeah. K A Z A. If you know all the Q without U words in English, that's mm -hmm. a great shortcut. If you know the in this is Scrabble specifically. If you know what's called stems, like S A T I N E is six letters. Where if you pick up almost every any other letter, you'll have a seven mm -hmm. legal seven letter word. That's another shortcut. Yeah. If he just knows those, he could probably be a decent <laughs> Thai Scrabble player yeah. without knowing a word of of Thai. Yeah, and I think. Part of it, is, so there's two things that we're sort of talking about here. One of them is sort of selectively learning some subset of all the possible things you can learn in a subject to get greater efficiency. And I think that's, part of this is sort of going into the same principles we talked about again, directness and, and these sorts of ideas. But this is definitely something I think is really relevant to learning languages because I think part of the reason a lot of language learning is inefficient is that not only are you not doing any direct practice, but you're often, what is driving what kind of rules you learn is just some book that you had. And so what I found is that the best way to learn words is when you need those words. And not only will you remember them better, but then you're learning the words that you need as you need them, as opposed to just memorizing huge lists of words that are that you may or may not use at some point in the future. So that's sort of relevant to hear what, what, what we were talking about with the Scrabble example, at the very least, that you know, if you are learning exactly what you need, yeah, you might be missing some things, but you might also get to a level where you can perform pretty good in a lot less time than someone who did literally everything to get to that point. I think the other thing that you're talking about is that there are sort of two levels when you're learning something. One is sort of the kind of unconscious direct result of feedback and practice that you just, you know, you're drilling this again and again and again, and you're just getting a little better each time. And maybe you don't know why you're getting better. It's just some sort of unconscious internalized practice. And then there's sort of the higher level of top down. Okay. There's some sort of theory I have. So like we were talking about putting the eyes in the middle, that's something that maybe you could have inferred that after thousands of repetitions, but if someone just tells you it, then you already are, are kind of nearer to a starting point. And I think both aspects of learning are important. And that's one of the things that I talk about in the book about sort of balancing those trade-offs because if you get stuck with something, then sometimes it can make sense to, okay, let's see what other methods are out there. What are other techniques people are using? Because for virtually any skill, like this eye idea, which is, of course, you know, maybe isn't new to a lot of people or not new to drawing, but if you are, you know, really good at drawing, this is something you know. This is something that you've struggled with and you've overcome and you've codified as a rule. Similarly, if you're learning chess, you know, the basic ending patterns or basic opening patterns or basic, you know, sort of, you know, pins and forks and these basic concepts, these are things that you know. And so there's sort of an interplay that, you know, you play some games, you play some games. And then once you've played some games, you go and you maybe read a little book and then they teach you some of these little tricks and you're like, oh, okay, that's good. And then you go back and you play some games. And so just the same way that you do drills sort of in, in comparison with the real activity, you also, you know, read a book and then you bring it back to the real world. And, and that sort of balance happens between, you know, bottom up learning and, and top down. Well, uh, Scott Young, first off, thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, yeah, this is we, great. This is our, our second conversation in seven years or six <laughs> years and uh, both of them about learning. And I'm, I just, I love your book. Uh, uh, it's, it's a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And I think in today's society where we're going to have to learn skills quickly as opposed to de depending on what we learned in college 10 years earlier or 15 years earlier i think this is going to be critically important uh ultra learning master hard skills outsmart the competition and accelerate your career and there's so much i've learned from reading this and from listening to you talk and and following your story 
Uh, thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Excellent. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.